we give people a couple of minutes to get joining still. I think people are still going, coming in. Okay. Uh, first, I want to make sure you're seeing my slides. I mean, I have a, I, my Zoom has quit three times already on me in five minutes. Can you guys see my slides? Yep. It's yeah, Corporate yes. Financial Project, right? Yep. Okay. I don't know why it was so glitchy this morning. I, uh, I checked my broadband. It looks good, but you live with technology, you die with it, I guess. No. But welcome back. And um, we have quite, quite a lot to talk about today. So I'm going to get started. Um, last session, I laid out the broad themes for this class. And there's one theme that I did not get to that I want to kind of nail down first. But before I start, though, at the start of every class, I want to make sure there are no questions, logistical questions. You, know, you got the puzzle that I sent out next week. You can already see it's not a big deal. It's something to start you thinking. You know, hopefully, you get a chance to try it out. But are there any logistical questions before we start? Just put up your hand and... So we have a group of eight, is that okay? That's okay. In fact, that's one of the first logistical questions I was gonna address is I've been a little, a little, little confusing because if you look at the project description, it says a group of four to eight. And last session I said four to seven, let's make it four to eight. I don't want to override my own instructions. So it's four to eight. If you have eight people, of course, you have a bigger logistical challenge of getting people together, but I'll let you deal with that. So the groups can be four to eight. So let's review what we did in the last session. I laid out what the class was about, and it's about everything. Everything that happens in business is ultimately a corporate finance decision. I know one of the things that you can think about is no matter what background you came from, you might not think of yourself as a corporate finance player. You say, look, I used to be a marketing person, a strategy person. I used to be a director of a museum, a nonprofit. Guess what? You are all in corporate finance. You just didn't know it at the time. And then I laid out the broad themes, right? It's common sense, there's a big picture here you need to get. But uh, there's one final theme I want to emphasize because it's a theme that keeps coming up over and over. Remember those first principles? If you are going to make investments, what's the first principle? Make sure the return you make on that investment exceeds your hurdle rate, right? The financing principle says when you try to find a mix of debt and equity, make sure it's a mix that you can live with. It'll increase your value as a company, maybe even maximize it. And the way to think about whether you should pay dividends or buybacks is you ask yourself, do I have things to invest the cash in? If you don't give the cash back, that's not even corporate finance, it's common sense. But every decade, there will be somebody who gets up and says, those first principles don't matter anymore. We can break them. Why? The world has shifted. We're a digital economy. We're this, we're that. And you're hearing that now, right? We're a different kind of economy. Do those, old, those are so old fashioned. That was for a, di these principles were not for the 20th century. They've been around for a lo as long as business have been around. So here's my final message. And this is something I'm going to come back to over and over again. If you violate first principles, it's not a question of whether you will get punished. It's a question of when. I'll give you a story. It's a story about a company called Steady Safe. I'm not surprised that most of you have not heard of this company because it used to be a company that provided taxi cab service in Jakarta, Indonesia in the early 1990s. Now, Jakarta was, no, Indonesia was in a growth boom in the early 90s. And Steady Safe faced a challenge. It wanted to grow. It wanted to buy more taxi cabs so that it could grow to take advantage of the fact that the, that the region was prospering. And it decided to borrow money to fund that growth. You ready? You're going to be my consultant slash banker. And I'm going to come to you for some advice. I'm steady safe. I'm an Indonesian taxi cab company. I want to borrow money. And I'm trying to decide what kind of debt to use, long-term or short-term, what currency the debt should be in. 
You saying I don't know enough corporate finance yet. You already know the answer to the question. Let's let let your common sense drive you. Ready? You're the banker consultant. Here's my first question: How long term should my debt be? Mallory. Help me out here. How long term should my debt be? You're allowed to ask me back a question if you want. Um, my first thought would you want it, the debt to not be too long term. Like I'm thinking short term debt. And so you, you want me to borrow short term debt? Why? Because you're worried that there might be next, no next year. Is uh, your uncertainty is driving your choice? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'm any... right. That's just my first. No, that's fine. That's, it's a, you let, I, I told you to trust your intuition and intuition says short-term debt. Anybody want to disagree with that? What am I buying with this debt, Mallory? I'm going to come back to you. What am I buying with this debt? The taxis. Taxi caps, right? What is the first principle in, in corporate finance? What did we say debt should be like? Debt should reflect the investments you make with that money, right? If I'm buying taxi caps, you know the question you need to ask me is, how long does a taxi cab last? If it's 10 years, your debt should be 10 year debt. Now, let me ask you a second question. This is a much easier one. What currency should my debt be in? In the Indonesian currency. And why? Because that's, I, I just think it makes more, most sense if the business is being done in Indonesia to use the domestic currency. But should then all Indonesian companies use only Indonesian rupiah's debt? What is specific to this company that makes rupiah the right debt for it? That it's only in Indonesia. It's not like the other cabs words, are going to other countries. And when you get out of a cab in Jakarta, you don't pay in dollars, you don't pay in yen, you pay in rupiah. Their cash flows are in rupiah, their debt. So basically they should have taken 10 year rupiah debt. Congratulations, you gave me the right debt. But here's what actually happened. Steady state went to an investment bank. That's their first mistake. Bank called Peregrine, at that time a leading investment bank in Southeast Asia. And they asked him exactly the question I asked Mallory. And the investment bank said, take 10 year debt, say that part they got right, maybe by accident. But they said, borrow in dollars. And they gave a reason that sounded logical. It's a reason still given in a lot of emerging markets to companies to borrow in dollars. What's the rationale you think they gave Steady Safe for borrowing in dollars? Michael, do you want to try? What do you think they do? Why do you think they told Steady Safe to borrow in dollars? Maybe because other projects that they're going to have, they're going to be evaluating based on the dollar or if they want to uh, expand out into- Oh, the that would be a really logical reason, but that's not the reason. They gave a much more simplistic reason that you will see used over and over in emerging markets. You know what they told them? It's cheaper. It's cheaper. And in fact, it's technically true that borrowing in dollars is cheaper than borrowing in rupiah because you borrowed 4% rather than 11%. So I'm going to lay the foundations for something we're going to come back to. Is 4% lower than 11% Dwanish? This is an easy question. Play along with me. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Is 4% in dollars lower than 11% in rupiah? Not, ne not necessarily. Not necessarily. In fact, the you know, this is a trap that so many CFOs around the world fall, to, fall into that I've created an analogy that works really well for me. And you tell me whether it works for you. What's the temperature in New York right now? Probably 30 degrees. 30 degrees. Let's say you fly to Mumbai and you land in Mumbai. You're looking at the iPhone. You check the temperature and land in Mumbai. The iPhone is a really smart device. It seems to know where you are. And it tells you that the temperature is 30 degrees when you land in Mumbai. You should be in pretty much the same temperature, right? No. But how do we measure temperature in the US? We measure it in Fahrenheit. And when you land in Mumbai, the temperature is in Celsius. Is 30 equal to 30? Of course, but it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit equal to 30 degrees Celsius. It's not even close. 
30 degrees Celsius is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. When we talk about different currencies, we just can't compare numbers. That'd be com like comparing Celsius temperature to Fahrenheit temperatures. But in this case, that's the rationale steady save was given. Go borrow in dollars, it's cheaper. And to give steady save credit, they pushed back and they said, shouldn't we be worried about the fact that we're borrowing in dollars and funding investments where the cash flows are in rupiah? You know what Peregrine told them? Don't worry about it. The Indonesian government has pegged the exchange rate. You know what pegging an exchange rate means? Much of the Middle East has pegged exchange rates where the, where the government steps in and says, the exchange rate is fixed, don't worry about it. Has pegged the exchange rate and promised us that nothing bad will happen. Famous last words. Because Teddy said, listen to them, they went out and borrowed uh, no, $100 million, and they bought these taxi cabs, they threw them on the ground. For a few years, things went swimmingly well. Until you get to 1996. You know what happened? The Indonesian government that promised them that nothing bad would happen, woke up one day and decided that something bad was going to happen. And they devalued the Indonesian rupiah by 70%. You ready for the morning after? You wake up at steady save. Tell me what's happened to your balance sheet. Your assets are all in rupiah, right? Now, in dollar terms, they were 30% of what they were yesterday because of the devaluation. Now, if you'd borrowed all your money in rupiah as well, that would have been knocked down 70% as well. You wouldn't have been happy about what happened, but you wouldn't be in trouble. But your debt is in dollars. It, you still owe exactly what you did yesterday. So guess what happened to Steady Safe? They went bankrupt. The only good thing that came out of this is they took their investment banker down with them. If you ask me, it happens far too infrequently. Investment bankers are always there at the wedding. They're never there at the divorce. Let me take that back. They're at the wedding, the wedding planners. But there's another branch of the investment bank that's also a divorce lawyer. They get you at both ends. I would say some terrible things about investment banks over the next 15 weeks. And I mean every single word of it. No. It's, uh, you, know, you, know, you know how investment banks do these ads showing you how great they are. Have you seen these? They're tombstone ads. There's a very, you know, it sounds morbid, but a tombstone ad basically tells you, look at the deals we did last year. We're JP Morgan, deal one, deal two, deal three, deal four. I've been tempted to actually raise money and run these or, or run the same ads for the investment banks, but my ads will have a twist. Here's what the twist will look like. In the early 90s, a company called Snapple came out of nowhere and caught our attention. Remember the iced teas and this is amazing and so Quaker Oats decides to buy Snapple. And they hire Morgan Stanley to tell them how much to pay. And you know, Morgan Stanley comes up with the number, you know, five billion. They pay five billion, 1992. Four years later, Quaker Oats decides to sell Snapple. And their advisor again, Morgan Stanley, you know what they sold it for? 500 million. You don't need to do any internal rate of return calculations. You know, if you pay 5 billion in 92 and you get back 500 million four years later, this was one heck of a bad investment. But guess what? Morgan Stanley got advisory fees on both ends of that transaction. For what? You could have asked your doorman, how much should I pay for Snapple? He said, look, I really like this. Like, how about three, four, five billion? And then you give them a $10 tip and you could have got exactly the same quality advice. It's, it amazes me how often we do things that really don't make sense. And then they blow up and say, how did that happen? About 15 years ago, 
we decided to lend money to people with credit problems, bad credit histories. We ran some data analysis to show that these people never default. Don't ask me how that happens. You pick a period of time, it could happen. And we lent to them at too low a rate. What's going to happen? These are people with credit problems for a reason. They live on the edge of defaulting. All you need is a tipping point, right? An economy slowing down, losing your job. They defaulted. That, in a nutshell, is the 2008 crisis. The 2008 crisis was not that you had subprime mortgages. It's that those subprime mortgages were being lent out at rates that didn't reflect the underlying default risk. So when you hear people, I don't care how high profile, telling you the world has changed, those first principles are from the 20th century, push back. And one of the things I will talk about repeatedly through the class is don't assume just because you see a big name attached to a transaction that people have thought through the consequences. So what I'd like to do is spend about 10 minutes talking about this project that I've kind of brought up over and over and talk a little bit about what this project is and how I hope it'll help you kind of nail down corporate finance. And then each of you should find a group. And as I said, now I've already get, got a couple of people you know, putting themselves in the orphan list. Don't be so quick to make yourself an orphan. Reach out to other people first, make sure you can find a group. If you cannot, we'll find, I know, we'll work on getting a group for you. Every person in the group will pick a company. So let's say Sarah creates a group of five. Every person in the group will pick a company. I would strongly suggest that there be a theme that connects the companies. The theme can be very broad. It can be travel. So if Sarah, if your group is travel. What are the companies that can go in there? It can be an airline. It can be Southwest Air. It can be um, booking.com, a booking company. It can be Airbnb. It can be, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can have a, a traditional Marriott in there. Basically, travel is broad enough. And the reason the theme helps is it'll save you some time in collecting data about the underlying business. In fact, to show you how broadly I define theme, I mean, at least one group every year picks vice as its theme. You know what goes in that group, right? There'll be a couple of cannabis stocks, an alcohol company is a must, a tobacco company in there. They're actually publicly traded brothels in Nevada that you can throw into the mix as well. I'm not strong pushing you there. But I'm saying I will allow you to define theme broadly enough that you can get, but you no, know, that's good. But I'm gonna add some constraints and these constraints are to protect you. One is you need some history for the company. So basically make sure you have a company with at least a year or two of history. Doesn't have to be publicly traded history, it could be, so Airbnb might not have been publicly traded for two years, but that. Second, I'd like you to pick a money-making company. The money-making doesn't have to be 2020. 2020 is a very bad year to test to see. It can be 2019 or 2018 even, so you have to have, a, and you know why I want you to do that? Because if you pick a young money-losing company, corporate finance doesn't get difficult, it's get, it gets much too easy. Think of why. Remember, we take a young money losing company. We know it's all about the investment decision. But once you get past that, the rest becomes trivial, right? You can't afford to borrow money. You can't afford to pay dividends. There's not much to do. And I, for your own sake, would strongly recommend you steer away from financial service companies. Not because corporate finance doesn't apply to them, but to analyze a bank or an investment bank, you need to get familiar with the regulatory capital and the overlay that lies over these companies. And unless you come from that background, that's not something you want to be spending the next 15 weeks over. Can you pick a private company? Absolutely. It doesn't have to have a stock price. 
But if you do pick a private company, the onus is on you to get the financials. So if it's a family business and you're part of the family, make sure you're not shunned as part of the family, that you're part of the family, the family trusts enough to give you financials. And here's what you're gonna be doing. And I'll just show you the first page of this because I want to spend the, now after you pick the company, is after you pick that company, every week, you will be applying what we do in class that week to your company. So starting this session, going into next week, we're gonna talk about corporate governance. Basically in corporate governance, we're asking where does the power lie in the company? How much power do stockholders have, managers have? Where, what drives this company? And we'll, I, you know, I, I, this is an applied class. What I'm going to do is have six companies be my lab experiments through this class. And I'll go through the six, and you will see that there's a company that, that you can latch on to no matter what company you pick. The first company I pick is Disney. You know why I pick Disney? Everybody here kind of knows what Disney does. You're gonna be surprised when I show you the insides of Disney at how much of Disney's value comes from different parts, but everybody kind of gets Disney. Whereas if I picked Alcoa, we'd be spending half the class struggling, what exactly does Alcoa do? Large, US entertainment company. The second company I'm gonna pick is a company called Vale. You heard of Vale? It's a Brazilian mining company. It's the largest iron ore producer in the world. You say, why are you picking Vale? To get as different from Disney as I can, so I can take Vale through the process of estimating hurdle rates, investment analysis, the right financing mix. So everything I do in this class, I'm gonna do on Vale as well. The third company I'm going to pick is a company called Tata Motors. Large Indian automobile company, but you're going to see very quickly that the Indian is a bit of a misnomer here because of what Tata Motors has done in the last decade and where it's grown, who it's acquired. But the reason I picked Tata Motors is it's part of a family group called the Tata Group, one of India's largest family group companies. And for many of you, picking companies in Asia and Latin America, you will find your company is part of a group. You're saying, so what? When your company is part of a group, one of the challenges you face as a company is when you make decisions, you're making decisions that might be in the best interest of the group rather than the best interest of the company. Like how much debt should I take? It might not be your choice. The, the group has interest and that's going to play out in every aspect of corporate finance. You might be taking investments that you look at and say, well, that makes no sense. Why are they doing this? But then you step back and say, I see it makes sense because Tata Consulting Services might benefit from this project. The fourth company I'm going to focus on, is a company called Baidu. William, you've heard of Baidu? William Clements? No, you know, no, when no. I first heard of Baidu, when I landed in Shanghai a few years ago, and I made a blog post just before I left, and I wanted to check to see if my blog post had gone on. And I use Google Blogger, very old fashioned. I don't do, you know, I'm too lazy to do any of the, 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 the upscale stuff. So I landed in Shanghai, I type in the link to my blog, and it's not there. It's disappeared. I said, this is a 12 hour flight. What the heck happened over the last 12 hours? So I said, I should be able to find it on Google. And so I type in google.com, not here. Trillion dollar company gone away in 12 hours. It's like a Twilight Zone episode. Then I asked somebody and they said, you got to get a VPN. You can't do this directly. And I said, what to get on Google? I've got to get a VPN. This is a long lead in to Baidu. Baidu is a search engine. The reason you've never heard of it is if you're not in China, you probably never use Baidu. But it is a very large and profitable search engine. And I picked Baidu because, hey, you know, how can you talk about anything in business without bringing in a Chinese component? So I've got a Chinese company. It's a technology company. So it allows me to kill two birds with one stone. Talk about how is corporate finance different when you're a technology company. And it's a company where corporate governance is dead even before you begin. 
And we'll talk about why, because the way Baidu, but Baidu, do you know where Baidu is traded? Which exchange? Anybody? New York. The NASDAQ. It's a Chinese company. And the reason it's traded in the NASDAQ is it's viewed as a company in a sensitive business and the Chinese government has restrictions on a company like that being listed and foreign investors investing in it. So it does a little sleight of hand to get around that rule. And we'll talk about how that plays out. And it's not just Baidu, Alibaba has the same structure. So Baidu, everything I do in the class, I'm gonna apply in Baidu. The fifth company I'm gonna look at is Deutsche Bank. Why? Because I like horror stories. And Deutsche Bank is a horror story that keeps giving. It's like watching Freddy Krueger, right? Don't go down into the basement. You're going to get killed and people keep going down into the basement. I can't stop myself with Deutsche. This is like a car accident you drive by that you can't take your eyes off. I want to talk about how corporate finance plays when you're a regulated financial service company. Because you're constrained. There are things you can do in traditional companies you can't do at a bank and I want to talk about that. And the sixth business I'm gonna analyze is a business called Bookscape. It's really not its name. It's actually a privately owned bookstore in New York City. I won't name, I changed names because I don't want you to walk into that bookstore and say, hey, I noticed that you were talked about in my class. But you might guess which bookstore it is as we go through the class. You know why I picked it? Because it's a small privately owned business. And I want to talk about how corporate finance decisions get made at small private businesses. What's similar, what's different. So through the course of this, this class, every time I introduce a topic, I'm going to take these six companies through the process. And then I'm gonna throw the ball back to you and say, hey, you picked a company, try it out. So as you look at these pages, I won't go through the rest. Every part of this class, you will see the basic questions I would like you to address. You'll also see at the bottom of the page, I tell you whether this part of the analysis is going to be more soft or hard because some parts of the analysis, you'll have a lot of numbers to back you up. And some parts of the analysis will require more judgments. Corporate governance has a fewer numbers, more judgment. Hurdle rates, more numbers, less judgment. So you're not looking for the wrong, the wrong places. And I also list out things that you might find on my website that help you. So for instance, if you find that your company has 10% of its shares held by insiders. You might say, is that good? Is that high? Is that low? And let's face it, most of us don't have that perspective, right? We don't know what's typical in a business. So here's what I do at the start of every year. I compute those averages for you across all companies. Say in this business, in this sector, a typical company, 25% of its shares are held by insiders. Your company actually has less insider holding than a typical company basically to give perspective. So every week you're going to go through this. And I'll tell you upfront, even though I know none of you are going to listen on this, the best way to do this project is to do it in real time each week. Because things are fresh, you can get it done. Having said that, almost none of you are going to listen to me on this one. Because you're going to put things off. I understand. In fact, some of you will not even pick your projects. Given the history of this class, I can predict this will happen. And if this person's in your group, he or she's gonna drive you crazy. They won't even pick their company till the 15th week. There's something, you know, there's something that causes people to do that. That's why you're gonna get that nagging email every Thursday saying, hey, where are you on the project? Hoping that that'll prod you into action. So any questions on the project? Hey, Professor, I just have a quick question. Yep. Um, where, does the, where does the group come in? It seems like a very individual project. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So let me talk a little bit about how the group plays out here. When you look at corporate governance and you look across five companies, right? So let's suppose your five companies are Airbnb, Marriott. You're going to find, for instance, that some of your companies um, 
you know, the board of directors is smaller, some are larger. So the group part comes in after you've collected the numbers in your company. You have hurdle rates for all five companies. One will have a high hurdle rate, the other will have a lower hurdle rate. Having a group gives you a way of talking about why some companies have more risk than others, how, why some companies use more debt than others. So if you compare Marriott to Airbnb, and I'll make this easy, Marriott has a lot of debt. Airbnb doesn't. They're both in your group. And the question I have is, what's different about these companies? The answer is pretty obvious there, right? Why does Marriott have a lot of debt? Because its business model is hotels and borrowing money. And Airbnb's business model is to be an intermediary and they're not making money. They don't have enough earnings to go out and borrow money. So the advantage of the group basically is when you present the numbers, you will present the numbers across your group. And when you analyze the companies, rather than repeat the same thing, you can go to the top. These five companies all share this common theme, but here's where they're different. It'll make your analysis richer if you can talk with each other, right? As you go through this group, I mean, do the numbers. So the analysis for your company is yours, the, coming up with the numbers, but the Overall analysis might require talking as a group about the differences across your companies. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna to turn to the first packet now. So by now the syllabus and the project, if you haven't downloaded them yet, try to do it. But, um, as PowerPoint waits to set them into reading form. If you have your first packet with you, pull it up. If you don't, no, it's okay. You can follow along with my slides, but at some point in time, I'd like you to pull up the slides and kind of have it available either in digital form. That might be all you need. Now why print off paper when you don't have to? So let's turn to, what, to actually the heart of this class. Let's start. But going back, I told, I promised you you'd see this big picture over and over again. I'm going to keep that promise. Remember the big picture of corporate finance, the investment principle, the financing principle, the dividend principle. And I said, what gives corporate finance its singular focus is the fact that you have an objective. The objective is to maximize the value of your business. But that's controversial, especially in today's day and age. Okay? In fact, to see why it's controversial. Think about all of the different stakeholders in a company, especially a publicly traded company. Let me list them out. And as I go through this list, here's what I want you to start thinking about. Which of these stakeholders should be given primacy? So you have shareholders. What do shareholders do? They invest the equity and they get a residual claim. You know what a residual claim? They get whatever's left over. Then you have lenders, bankers, bondholders. What do they do? They lend money to the company with a contractual obligation to get paid back. Then you have employees. Employees, of course, you know, make the company run. They're the, they're the engine that drives the company. Of course, they don't do this for, for free. They work for a wage or that they negotiate either individually or through a union. You got customers. After all, if they don't buy the product, there is no business, right? They have customers. You have society. You're a company that's part of a broader society and you create side costs, side benefits for society. And society's front end is of course the government and you have obligation to the government starting with taxes. And of course you have regulations, laws. And finally you have competitors. It's funny to think of competitors as stakeholders, but remember, you can enrich your competitors by doing really stupid things, or you can impoverish them by doing really smart things. So I'm gonna start with, with, with a question, and I'll make it a, in the form of a poll. So take a look at this poll and I want you to just don't look for the right answer. Don't look for the answer I'm looking for. Give me your gut feeling about which of these stakeholders 
should be given primacy. So I'll give you about 45 seconds because it shouldn't take too long to do. So the choices are shareholders, bankers, and basically the choices are listed. I didn't throw competitors in because I don't think anybody in their right mind said competitors should be given primacy. The way some companies are run, maybe that's what the end game becomes. How do we make competitors better off? Okay, I think we're pretty close to, I'm gonna end the poll there and I'm gonna share the results. So as you can see, you know, about half of you think shareholders should be given primacy and the other half is spread all over. And of course there is the second highest is actually, let's keep everybody happy, which is what stakeholder wealth maximization is. Okay. Now in traditional corporate finance, which group is given primacy? Anybody? It's an easy one. It's shareholders, right? Shareholders. And often, I, that, that's the challenge I get posed. Often by my colleagues, because let's face it, you have marketing people who think customers should be given primacy. You have you know, ESG people who think you know, society should be given primacy. There is a group that pretty much is behind every one of these stakes. So let's talk a little bit about what it is about shareholders that gives them primacy in traditional corporate finance. Anybody want to try, why do we give shareholders primacy? This is actually one of the questions on the weekly puzzle. And I think a few of you have already tried it. So since you thought about it, what is it about shareholders that leads us to give them primacy? Residual, residual claim to the business. Okay, help me out there. So how does the fact that shareholders have a residual claim give them privacy. Well, Why does that residual claim give them privacy? Well, I guess in the capital structure, everyone else benefits before they do. So- And it's not claim. just that they can benefit, it's that the, each of the other groups has a contractual claim with the company. So if you're a lender, you get a chance to negotiate the right interest rate. If you charge too low a rate, that was your, I mean, it was a mistake you made in the contractual setting. So lenders negotiate an interest rate, employees negotiate a wage. And maybe we can argue about the power or the lack of power of employees, and maybe the wage is too low, but they have a contract. Customers have a contract, right? You get a product and a service, it comes with all kinds of things that you can do if you don't like the product. And again, you can say it's too weak or too strong. You say, what's society's contract with companies? What do you think the tax code is all about? Now, again, we can debate whether companies actually are, are putting, but society has regulations, laws, taxes. Every other group has a contractual agreement. What do equity investors have? They get whatever's left over. There's no contractual protection. We give them primacy, not because they're special or we love them. It's because without it, there's nothing you can do, right? So if I tell you there's no residual claim, you can't claim anything, you can't go to, so for, for instance, you know, say, what about dividends? Dividends are not a contractual claim. You might buy shares expecting to get a dividend, but if the company cuts its dividends or refuses to pay them or eliminates them, you can't go, you can't go to court. Anybody can go to court and sue about anything, but you're not going to get any money back from saying, hey, you know what? This company told me they, they would pay dividends, but they don't. But stockholder, the way we've reconciled the fact that we're putting one group up in front is because we make a series of other assumptions. What I'd like to talk about is what those other assumptions are that allow us to put shareholders on top. Remember that financial balance sheet I showed you? You have assets, you know, assets in place and growth assets and debt and equity on the other side. I'll tell you what the true objective in corporate finance is and how it's become narrowed down to shareholders and then to share price. 
The objective in corporate finance was not to maximize the value of shareholders, but to maximize the value of the business. Remember, the business is composed of both lenders and equity investors. But here's how we do the dance. We say, you know what? Lenders can protect themselves. They can enter into claims. They can charge the right interest rate. So as managers, we're going to take care of just the shareholders because lenders can take care of themselves. Already, you can see an assumption being made about how much lenders are protected. We assume that lenders' contractual claims are protected. So we focus on shareholders, maximizing shareholder wealth. But then we run into a practical problem. Who is going to measure that? Well, do you see why that matters? If you have a company, you've invested in that company, you need to tell the managers, go out and increase my wealth. You're going to hire McKinsey to come in once every year to measure what the wealth is? I mean, you could, but you know it's incredibly biased and they make strange assumptions. So if the company is publicly traded, what do you end up latching on to as your measure of stockholder wealth? You take the stock price. Will that work? It depends on how well markets work, right? In a, in a market that's reasonably efficient. And how can we even use those words in a week after we saw what happened to GameStop? But in a market which is reasonably efficient, maximizing stock price will also maximize stockholder wealth because price and value are roughly the same. And maximizing stockholder wealth will also maximize the value of the business. A lot of assumptions along the way, but let's see how this version plays out. We talked about maximizing stockholder wealth, putting stockholders in the top. There is a version of this world that you're not going to like. I call this the cutthroat version of corporatism. You know what the cutthroat version of corporatism is? Stockholders are not just given primacy, but they take advantage of every other group. In what way? They borrow money from a company and then they cut corners. They do everything they can to squeeze lenders. They pay the least wages they can to employees. They try to, you know, essentially they don't allow you, you know, any kind of bargaining power to employees. They don't care about customers. They essentially will charge the highest price they can. They care about customers, but only in the sense of collecting revenues. They charge the highest price and for the for the least product they can deliver. They view societal constraints as something that they just escape out of, pay the least in taxes, don't care about regulations. And their objective is to essentially drive competitors out of business. Now already saying this is what the world look, this is what the world looked like in the late 1800s. Right? If you look at, go back and read the history of Andrew, and Andrew Carnegie was not a nice man. He might have done nice things in terms of charity. No, John D. Rockefeller was not a right, that is cutthroat corporatism at its limit. Basically, you are maximizing value and every other stakeholder group is getting squeezed. He's saying, I don't like that. I don't either. If this is where we end up with maximizing stakeholder stock prices, we're in big trouble. Now I'm going to come back and examine what can go wrong with traditional corporate financial objectives, but I want to get rid of a few false choices you're given. Here's the first one. If you increase your stock prices, it must be because you don't take care of your, I mean, how often do you hear that, right? You assume that if a company is increasing stock prices, it must be doing damage to its employees. Yeah, you heard it often enough, you think it's the truth. I actually looked at the list of the 100 best places, companies to work for in the US. If you get a chance, look it up, it's online. And take a look at how those, uh, those same companies in terms of stock prices. You know what you're gonna find? The companies that are doing the best in markets often are the companies that can also take care of them. I mean, let's make it personal. Two years from now, you're coming out of, you know, there are a year and a half from now, you're coming out of the MBA program and you can either go work at Tesla or you can go work at GM. GM is really has, first you got to work in Detroit as opposed to, I don't know where, San Francisco or Austin. That might already be an issue for you. But in addition to that, 
GM really has to sweeten the pot for you to even think about it because it's so much better as an employee to work in a company where stock prices are rising, especially if a chunk of your compensation is in the form of stock, restricted stock or options. So that choice of, do you want to maximize your stock price or do you want to take care of your employees strikes me as a false one. In some companies that choice works out, but in most companies, if you want one, you got to do the other. The second one is one I hear from a lot of marketing people. They say, oh, the stock price thing is all nonsense. You know what customers should do? They should maximize customer satisfaction. The stupidest objective I've ever heard. I remember uh, 20 years ago, I was at the, uh, it was the Gap. And the Gap. This was when the Gap was a retailer that was doing really well. How well were they doing? They decided to have a management conference in Sundance. You heard of Sundance? Don't go there, it's incredibly expensive. So they gather all the top managers together and they get a bunch of different people from different disciplines to come to talk to the managers. I had the singular misfortune of following the marketing guru because the marketing guru got up and he said, you know what, the objective of the gap should be to maximize customer satisfaction. And I got up and I said, and maybe this was impolite, that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Because if you believe that to be your end game, maximize customer satisfaction, you know what you should do at the gap? I don't know how many of you even shop at the gap anymore, but think of your shopping experience at the gap. You walk into the store, it's a well-lighted store, you, you, you feel a little happier. You walk into the section and you get your khakis in the right size, you are you know, even happier. And then you get ready to walk out, there's something that puts a crimp on your happiness, right? What is it? Oh, the cash register. You gotta stop and pay for the damn thing. That's putting, that's reducing your satisfaction. I know it sounds absurd, but if you wanna maximize customer satisfaction of the gap, here's the suggestion, take out the cash registers. Let people walk in, take whatever they want, walk out. They'll be so happy. You go bankrupt in about two weeks, but you go bankrupt saying, look, I maximize customer satisfaction. Let me ask you a question. Do we as businesses want customers to be satisfied and happy? Yes. But why do we want that? Not because we live in reflected glory, but because we want them to keep coming back and buying our stuff. Again, let me ask you a question. I mean, people dump on Amazon all the time. Viewed as the most evil company in the face of the earth. But if you have to buy something online, why do you choose Amazon? Because your life is so much simpler, right? I live in San Diego. I buy something from Amazon, I don't like it, there are drop-off boxes. I just go drop it off, I'm given the instantaneous credit. I buy stuff from other people. I can't even find them after I bought them. They change their email address, they change their physical address, they're all gone. Again, it's a false choice. Companies that do well tend to be companies that take care of their customers. And there's a final choice you're offered. And this will make you feel really guilty. And especially since you're doing an MBA, get ready for it. Next Thanksgiving, hopefully we're past this distancing thing. You're back to family gatherings, mixed blessing, right? And somebody you've not seen, your uncle, your aunt says, you know, what are you doing? Say, I'm getting an MBA. Be ready sometimes for a look of pity and scorn saying, what? Are you thinking, you know, you're a sellout. You're getting an MBA? Because somewhere in there is this notion of, hey, you're an MBA, you're helping business increase your value. It must be at the expense of society. It's a deeply held view and it's fed into by Hollywood, right? I'll give you a link to my favorite movie. It's got other people's money. It's an old movie from the 1980s. And I'll send you the YouTube you know, a cut from it, but you can, all, you can also watch it somewhere. It's a movie about an activist, a choir, private equity guy already, you know, you can, you can have, who's, who's creating, he's doing a hostile acquisition of a New England-based company that makes telephone cables, you know, the old physical cables. 
So this whole movie is about a hostile acquisition. You say, that sounds incredibly boring. It's actually a fun movie to watch because the ending is not as predictable as it is in most Hollywood movies. Bad guy loses, the good guy wins. Because in this case, you know who played the acquirer, the hostile acquirer, the activist investor? Anybody know? Danny DeVito. So have that vision in mind, Danny DeVito. You know who played the CEO of the Target company, the good guy? Gregory Peck. I know most of you haven't seen Gregory Peck, you know, distinguished white hair. Already you can see the stereotypes. There's corporate finance, Danny DeVito. There's the anti-corporate finance, Gregory Peck. Whose side are you going to take? And the reason I like this movie is rather than it ending with Danny DeVito in jail and Gregory Peck is running a glorious company, it ends with an annual meeting. I'm not kidding. This is the climax of the movie is an annual meeting. And at the annual meeting, Danny DeVito gets up and he says, and this is, you know, the, the, there are employees in the organization, the Gregory Peck is, is, Peck is sitting in the front row. And he says, I know you guys all hate me. In, incidentally, in this movie, you know what Danny DeVito's name was? He was called Larry the Liquidator. Larry the liquidator. He gets up and he says, I know you guys hate me because I plan to shut this company down. But he said, your real enemy is not me, it's fiber optics. Nobody was trying to say, right? You're making physical cable in a world that people are not buying physical cable. I am the vehicle delivering that message to you. I'm, I can look like the bad guy, but Guess what, even if I were not there, your business is gonna shrink and go away. Think about that when you think about GameStop and AMC and this morality play that's playing out there. I'm not saying the short sellers are right or wrong. I'm just saying the fundamental problems at AMC come from you and I not going into stores and buying our games there. It doesn't come from Melvin Capital selling short on the company. So what I'm trying to say is don't make this an easy choice where you say, look, I, I can't maximize stock prices because I want to care. Ultimately, the companies that increase value tend to be companies that take care of their employees, have satisfied customers, and don't piss off society too much, right? Because if you piss off society, you become a target. Think of the tobacco companies. So here's what I'd like to do to kind of introduce how we're going to think about corporate governance. I'm going to introduce a company, you know, a traditional publicly traded company as a set of four linkages. And here's what the linkages are. The first is, remember companies are not run by stockholders, they're run by managers, right? CEOs, boards of directors overseeing them. They're managers and managers supposedly take care of shareholders, but I want to start with that linkage. What is the link between shareholders and managers? In some companies, of course, the link disappears because you have a lead shareholder become the CEO of the company, but in most publicly traded companies of any age, there's a, there's a separation between st stockholders and managers. Then I want to talk about the relationship between companies and their lenders. The third link I want to talk about is companies and financial markets. And finally, I want to talk about companies and society. So let's start with what I call the utopian vision in corporate finance. This is where corporate finance was born and much of what corporate finance originally came up with came from this vision. And as I describe the assumptions I need for this utopian vision to hold, you know what your reaction is going to be? I don't agree with that assumption. So I'll tell you upfront, I don't agree with any of those assumptions, but I've already given that away, right? What did I call this, a utopian Vision. What's the essence of utopia? It never existed. So let's take each of these linkages and let's see what corporate finance assumes about each linkage that allows it to kind of focus on stock prices. So think of this as the word where maximizing stock prices is a safe assumption. You're not creating any side costs. First, in this world, we assume that stockholders have complete power over managers. I told you the assumptions are unrealistic. 
What are the mechanisms through which they impose this power? The first is the board of directors. In theory, the board of directors works for the stockholders, not the managers. It's supposed to protect stockholders and through the annual meeting. The stockholders have complete power over managers and managers are so terrified of what stockholders will do to them that they put stockholder interest first. Second linkage, in this world, banks and bondholders lend money to a company and even if they don't protect themselves, they've left loopholes the size of a Mack truck, the company doesn't take advantage of those loopholes. Why? Because you know, these companies might have to go back and borrow money, so they worry about reputation effects. Third, in this world, companies reveal information about what's happening to them honestly and in time. I told you it was completely unrealistic. So I'll give you an example of how things would work out in this world. I'm an Apple user. I've been an Apple user for a long time. And for a very long time, Apple did not come out with a laptop. Finally, in the early 90s, they come up with their very first laptop. It was called the Power Book. It was a laptop only in the loosest sense of the word. It weighed like 20 pounds and it heated up like crazy. So if you kept it on your lap, you know, you, you didn't feel particularly comfortable, but we were happy we had a laptop. It had one small issue. Every once in a while, it would go up in flames. The batteries they were using would just spontaneously ignite. Now, this is not a feature you usually go looking for in a laptop, right? You don't say that laptop, no spontaneous combustion on that one. No. It'd make your next presentation incredibly memorable but make your next flight trip into a fiasco. So in the world that I just described, what did Apple do the minute they found out their laptops were going up in flames? They'd run out to Mark and say, hey guys, we just wanted to let you know, our laptops are hot. That gives you some insight into how companies hold back the truth, right? Technically, is Apple te technically Apple selling the truth, right? App no, laptops are hot. What you hear when you say laptops are hot is they're selling a lot. You don't think of going up in flames. So let me take that back. In the world I described, Apple would go up and say, hey, you know what, guys? Our laptops are going up in flames. We just want to let you know. And in this world, markets are rational and efficient. So I'll give you some perspective here. Uh, how many of you guys have been in a trading room? You might have, you know, anybody who worked as a trader? Okay. If you're in a trading room, tell me whether this is a good description of a trading room, because in the utopian world, a trading room is full of polite intellectuals who watch the news coming by and then are involved in a rational intellectual discussion about what it means for value. Rational and intellectual are two words you never use in a trading room, right? But in this world, that's what they are. And finally, in this world, there are no social costs and benefits. You know what the definition of a social cost is? It's very simple. It's a cost you create for society that cannot be traced back and charged to you. So people often give the example of environmental cost, but an environmental cost that can be traced and charged back to a company is not a social cost, it's an economic cost. But already you can, I can see some of you thinking, only bad companies create social costs. You know what? Every business creates social costs. Every business creates social costs. I, some are small, some are large. Some might seem trivial, but they can add up. I'll give you an example. There's that hot dog stand. If any of you are in New York, there's that hot dog stand right outside Stern. He's right in the middle of the driveway. He's been there for 25 years. And every time I walk down the sidewalk, he's right in the middle of the sidewalk. So I've got to walk four steps to the left, then go six steps. It adds like 14 steps every day. And I walk. You're saying, that is so trivial. Think of the tens maybe thousands of people who come down that sidewalk multiply by 14 steps. You know, who knows how many heart attacks you're creating in the long term with this? That's a social cost. Every business creates social costs and benefits. So you know what I do in the utopian world? I do what economists do whenever they have a problem. 
I assume it away. There are no social costs, no social benefit. What are you talking about? Now do you see why I've made these assumptions in this world? When I go out and increase my stock price, it has to come from doing it the hard way, building a business, producing a product that somebody needs. I can't take shortcuts like what? I can't rip off my bondholders. I can't lie to financial markets. I can't create large costs for society. So in that word, you can argue that this is all you need. Just ask CEOs to maximize stock prices and everything is going to work out. So I'm going to call that utopian corporatism where companies focus on maximizing stock price, but there are no side costs for anybody. Every other stakeholder is going to be okay with this. But that's partly because of the assumptions I've made. So already you can see I had cutthroat corporatism and we all agreed that was not what we wanted. Utopian corporatism looks a lot better, but for this to be true, we need well-functioning financial markets, a stock price that actually reflects value, and we need mechanisms to minimize or eliminate social costs and take care of lenders. So let's talk about what can go wrong. In fact, the real question to ask is what cannot go wrong? Because like Murphy's Law, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So let's leave the utopian world and talk about the real world. Let's take each of the linkages and think about what can happen. First, do stockholders have complete power over managers? Are you kidding me? The two mechanisms I talk about, the board of directors and the annual meeting are not very effective at keeping managers. And we'll talk about what? And if you think they're ineffective in the US, they're even more ineffective outside the US. If you lend money to a firm and you don't protect yourself, it's again a question of when you will get ripped off, not whether you get ripped off. Companies sometimes commit outright fraud. They lie to financial markets, but they almost all of them try to control the flow of information, right? It's human nature. Let's hold back on bad news. Maybe it'll go away. And markets are not exactly rational and cool about the way they assess news. And finally, the world we live in, there are social costs and social benefits. So let me lay the foundations for each of those critiques. Let's start with the first one. Stockholders versus managers. In theory, with the board of directors protecting you and the annual meeting as your mechanism for replacing managers, stockholders have complete power over managers. But in the real world, neither of those mechanisms is particularly effective. Let's think about why. Let's start with the annual meeting. So I'm gonna start with the question and you don't have to put up your hands, just think about the answer because you know, my guess is many of you will say yes to it. How many of you own shares in a publicly traded company? Any publicly traded company? My guess is most of you, unless we forced you as Stern to sell all of that to put into tuition, but that's between you and Stern. So let's say the answer to that was 80. How many of you have actually gone to an annual meeting. On this one, I need a show of hands. Anybody here gone to an annual meeting? Okay, not bad, I have. So uh, let me make sure the hands up are actually the annual meeting. Actually, they're going down as I'm looking at it. We're down to four. So down, yeah, it was, we're, no, down to two. Okay, so if you've, got, if you've gone to an annual meeting, keep your hand up, don't take it down. So I count three people or four people who've gone to annual meetings. Now, you can put your hands down. Think about why so many of us who own shares don't go to annual meetings. I'll, I'll make this personal. I own shares in 53 companies. I've never been to an annual meeting because it doesn't make any economic sense for me to do so. <laughs> if I own shares in Coca-Cola, you know what going to an annual meeting involves? I have to fly to Atlanta. That's going to cost me, you know, the New York Atlanta flight is for some reason a ripoff. Maybe Delta controls the whole market. So I'll pay like $300 round trip. And I've got to stay in that 
peach tree section of, of, of Atlanta, you know what I'm talking about, where the whole place empties out at five in the evening and you have only hotels left in there and pay another $500. By the time this is all said and done, spent about $1,000 just going to the meeting. There goes my profit for the year. For most of us, it makes no sense to go to an annual meeting. But companies give us a way to be at the meeting without actually being at the meeting, right? In the old days, this used to take the form of an envelope. You would get about six weeks before the meeting. And what would it contain? I mean, every shareholder in the company would get this. Today, you actually get this from your, from your brokerage houses. What do you get as a, even though you're not able to, you get a proxy vote, which means you can vote for the issues that will come up at the meeting, who should be on the board of directors, what the company should do without actually being in the, at the meeting. You know what percentage of proxy, oh, you know, I, I, when you get that big envelope in the mail, you might still be getting it. I don't know about you, but I don't feel the urge to open it up and read the 12 pages of names I don't even. My question is, you know, where does it go? If I'm feeling environmentally conscious, it goes into recycling. If not, it goes into trash. And I'm not alone. Less than half of all proxies at annual meetings actually get returned to the meetings. Now, all, so if I have a thousand shares in Coca-Cola and I have those proxies and I throw them in the trash can, I have a question, what happens to those thousand votes? Anybody have any idea what happens to votes of all those proxies that don't get returned? Does it go to I'm sorry, uh, Sam, what, what happens to it? I was gonna say, I think it, it depends on what the vote's over, because I know with like Dell, when they were voting on whether the leverage buyout from Michael Dell was gonna be allowed, they kept changing the rules about whether no votes were gonna be counted as no's or just not counted altogether. But th that's when you have a contest on an acquisition. At an annual meeting, the votes that don't get returned get counted as votes for incumbent management. Think about it, what have I done? I've devised a system that's still in favor of incumbent management which means it's very difficult to get a no vote to 51%, not impossible, but very difficult to get a no vote to 51% in an annual meeting. One of the things we're gonna talk about is um, how CEOs often serve as chairman of the board of directors that's supposed to look, look over. It never made sense to me. Basically the board of directors is supposed to oversee the CEO and the CEO is the chairman of that board. So you're basically overseeing yourself and telling me whether you're doing a good job. So often you have these fights about CEOs becoming chairman of the board or being chairman of the board. So about seven years ago, this came to a head at JP Morgan. And you know who runs JP Morgan, right? It's Jamie Dimon. And Jamie Dimon was both chairman and CEO. And there were investors and some of the big institutional investors saying that doesn't make sense you shouldn't serve as the chair of the board. So this came up for a vote at the annual meeting. And if you looked at the news story the day after the meeting, here's what you'd have seen. Jamie Dimon wins contest. I think he had 61% yes votes uh, that he should stay on his chair and 39% no votes. That sounds like a pretty decisive win, right? And I saw that number, my reaction was, everybody who voted actually voted against him but because so many people don't vote at JP Morgan, you start off with 50. I mean, this is like having an election where the incumbent gets the votes of anybody who doesn't show up to vote. In most elections, you don't even have to vote for yourself. You've already won. It's very difficult to get change at an annual meeting. We'll talk about sometimes what, pe what can be done to alter the power structure, but it's very difficult. Saying, what about the board of, and, and if you're saying, you know, what about the institutional investors? Won't they be watching out for me? They'd be you know, watching my back. Yeah, they're watching your back to see how they can stab you. Because here's the reality of institutional investors. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, the fidelities, the state streets. First, if they don't like the way a company is run, rather than challenging management, what's the action that most of them will take? 
What do most institutional investors do when they don't like the way a company is run? They sell and move on. They vote with their feet. And when they vote, you know who they vote with? Take a look at this graph. Basically, it shows you how, you know, what percentage of institutional investors support management as opposed to shareholder resolutions. It's not even close. So if you have a company where the top 10 investors are all big institutional investors, you might as well throw up hands and say, I have no chance in this company. Which brings me to my other device for keeping shareholder power, which is the board of directors. You know, in theory, the board of directors was created publicly traded companies to protect shareholders and make sure their interests were kept first. Fat chance of that happening. And here's why. If any of you worked at a company, I mean, many of you worked at companies, go back and look at the annual report for your company and take a look in the annual report as who serves on your board. Just with curiosity, just, you know, as a, as a, just, who's serving on the board? Then ask yourself a question. Who came up with these names? I mean, clearly somebody didn't pick them out of a phone book. You think it was a nominating committee? Maybe. But even a nominating committee, before they put a name on, who did they check with? The CEO. It's not as bad as 30 years ago. The CEO actually handpicked the people who would be on the board. In fact, many companies, that's still true. And if you're the CEO handpicking directors, let me ask you a question. Who are you going to pick to serve on your board? You can go pick the 10 most uh, well-informed, curious, challenging individuals who put you on the spot and ask you tough questions. That's option one. Or you can walk over to your local country club, walk into the bar area, look for the 10 most slosh people. You can say, would you like to serve on my board? Tell me what's gonna make your life easier? When John Mack became CEO of Morgan Stanley, the first three people he added to the board happened to be members of his country club. I haven't double checked to see whether they were in the bar area but that doesn't sound to me like you're seeking out the best possible people to serve on your board. In most companies, directors get more of their compensation from, uh, and they get paid some absurd amounts with pensions than they do as shareholders. In fact, in many companies, when directors own shares, you know how they got the shares? The company gives them the shares. And finally, one of the challenges when you look at a company, you'll see that you look at the list of directors, two of them are CEOs of other companies. How does Sherry Sandberg have the time to be CFO of Facebook and serve in the board of Disney? This is no reflection on that person. How does a person be a CEO or a CEO of another company and serve on a board? You don't have the time. Put simply, it turns out that boards of directors are not very effective because you start off with a group of people who are already beholden to the CEO. So much of corporate governance law and other the laws have been you know, to try to make boards more independent, to remove those obvious cases of insiders in the board. Sarbanes-Oxley 20 years ago, that was the objective. And people thought that this would fix boards. You know what the, end, the, the board that ran Lehman was actually an independent board. But can you have an independent, ineffective board? Absolutely. You think if they're independent, how come boards don't work better? The first is, have you ever been at a meeting where somebody brings out Robert's Rules of Order? The game is done. Once that book comes out, nothing is going to get done because everything has a process. If you don't follow the process, it doesn't come on. Board meetings are incredibly scripted events. The second is once you're on a board, you feel this urge to be part of a team. And there's one person that's viewed as the authority figure. So you have 10 people on the board and one of them happens to be a CEO. Guess what? It's human nature to say he knows more about the company than I do. You see where I'm going? 
you can create independent boards, but boards are not going to get more effective. So I'm going to suggest something that has zero chance of happening, but something to think about. Because right now the game is tilted in favor of the CEO. So when you have to do a big acquisition as a CEO, you get up there and say, we're gonna do this big acquisition. Then you bring your team of investment bankers to hit the board with slide after slide, you know, and put number after number. And guess what? The acquisition is gonna go through. And to come up with this idea, I actually had to borrow from the Catholic church. I'm not Catholic, but I have gone to church every Sunday for pretty much the last, I don't know how long, you know, 30 years. The Catholic church must have some things right. Otherwise you don't survive for 2000 years. And a few hundred years ago, the Catholic church had a problem. You know what the problem was? People were become too many people were becoming saints because the process of becoming a saint in the Catholic church is you get a people, you get a dossier together of all the miracles a person. Had. Then you go to the Catholic church and look at all these miracles. And the Catholic church discovered that the people pushing for sainthood always had more motives. So they came in with the package and I guess the Pope since he or she, since he, I was going to say he or she, but obviously it's a he in this case, is he's infallible decides, say, you know, saint, not saint. They said, we've got to slow this process down. And they create, and this is an act of genius, with such a great word to go with, the devil's advocate. Where did the devil's advocate? The devil's advocate's job the Catholic Church was to be the counter. So when somebody said, you know, you know, this person should be saying these are the five miracles, the devil's advocate's job was a perverse one. Said, Those are not miracles. That's not a miracle. That's let me. And the devil's advocate was given the resources to push back. He said, how is it going to play out with the company? What's the problem right now? You have a CEO and no counterparty. I told you zero chance of it happening. You almost need a counterweight, right? Somebody who not only has the same gravitas as a CEO, think of it as the anti-CEO, the devil's advocate CEO, with the resources to back it up. So when you bring your bankers in, this is the greatest deal ever, let me show you. The, that other person also can hire bankers to bring you the counter. We need some pushback. Because without the pushback, the board of directors will never be able to stand up to CEOs. So I'm going to leave you with that slide and start. And I want you to, if you have, if you have, if you already picked a company, here's what I want you to do before Monday's class. I want you to find out who sits on the board of directors for your company. It should be easy enough to do. And I'll give you a reference you can go to that will tell you any conflicts of interest with that group. It's actually in the public domain with an SEC filing for, public, for US companies. So non-US companies will talk about how the absence of information is sometimes as revealing as any information you can find. Because on Monday when we start, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Disney's board of directors. I told you everything we do in this class is going to be applied. And the question I'm going to ask is not, is this an independent board, but is this an effective board? And I'll start with 1997, way back in Disney's history and take you all the way through 2020. So you can see how the board has changed over time. So that's it for today. And I will see you next Monday. And you will hear from me multiple times before then. Take care. Any final questions before you leave? So I kind of have a big picture question. So it's not yep. like we are, um, each person in the group's picking a company and then it's kind yes. of in the same industry. It's not like the group's picking a company, right? Each person picks a company, but you better check with the other people in the group because you need this common theme. So maybe what you do as a group is agree on the theme first. Yeah. And then can give people the freedom to pick companies. Pretty much the same and, industry, except for finance. My only advice is try to get a diverse group of companies, right? Okay. Small, large, US emerging market. The more diversity you get, the more interesting your discussion will become. And then I was going to choose, I know a lot of people can pick the same company, but I was going to choose a company that actually isn't doing that well. And it sounds like that's, that's not a good idea. As long as it has a history, you can see some profits in the rear view mirror. Okay. Right. Like you could pick GME because there's a, it used to make money. It hasn't made money since 2018, but you okay. don't want to pick Airbnb because it's never made money. Right. So as long as there's something you can go back to as a base for, from which you can extract future numbers. That's fine. Okay. Thank you.
Hey, Professor, I had a, I had a question. You said at yeah. the beginning of the class that you should uh, finance something for however long it's going to be useful. Um, no, 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 that's not what I said. I said, if you borrow something, it should reflect. So for instance, if you buy a house, let's make this personal. When you buy a house, you know what the right kind of loan for, that, for a house is? It's attached to the life. So if you plan to, the old days when people used to live in a house for 30 years, you know, often for the rest of their lives, the right mortgage was a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. But as people move to, hey, I want to hold the house and then I'm going to flip out to three years and move to a different house, you could argue that maybe you want to go to a shorter term mortgage, maybe even an adjustable rate mortgage. Think of that same phenomenon applied in a company. You're an infrastructure company and your projects are 50 year projects. You don't want to take one year debt to fund those projects because then you're exposing yourself to refinancing risk for no reason at all. We'll talk about when you might deviate from that rule and what you have to do when you deviate. But when you deviate from that rule, you're creating risk you don't have to. And at least you've got to be aware of it. What about in the other direction, though? What if you are going to buy something and use it for a year, but you take out a 10-year loan on it? That's not. That's just as dangerous, right? Because now you have those obligations for the next 10 years. And at the end of the year, what if your projects dry up? Right? So you don't want to lock in rates just because you can lock in rates because you can be ending up with obligations you can't service after that period. I'm gonna to have to run because my next class is starting in four minutes. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.